Welcome once again to our Lenten devotionals. It's now Wednesday, April the 8th, 2020. Well, we are now on the verge of one of the really most important days of our Christian year, and that's Monday, Thursday. And so tomorrow we'll have a very special Monday, Thursday devotional. You know, normally we would have been getting together, wouldn't we, on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. I'd even thought about doing a, a Saturday night uh, Lent, or, uh, Easter vigil. But, of course, that kind of got wiped off the table this year. So we're making the best of it, and I'm hoping that you've enjoyed these these Lenten devotionals. Again, I've, I've heard some nice comments from people that they've tuned in and are enjoying them. And Like I said, share them with your friends. If they don't come to Oakland United Methodist Church or Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church, they're welcome to listen. We love to have all, all people listen because really we base these on the Word of God and then just kind of a conversation. Like I told you the other day, I'm kind of like I'm sitting here having a cup of coffee with you because that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm drinking a cup of coffee, not and talking to you. I like what one of our friends at <laughs> Oakland United Methodist Church told me shortly after I've been there. She said, I've never seen anybody like coffee like you do. And I mean, I, I know people who just drink pot after pot after pot of coffee every day. I mean, they drink it. By the time seven o'clock's come, they're on their second pot, you know, and by noon, they're third or fourth and make it in the afternoon. Then they'll make it eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Well, I'm not quite to that level. If I drink it very late in the afternoon, I'm going to probably be up all night. So anyway, I do enjoy my coffee. I enjoy, though, most of all, just visiting with folks and listening to them. And, you know, it's funny how all this played out, isn't it? I, I, I keep telling people this. I don't think I've mentioned this on one of these Linton devotionals. I I just somehow can't help but believe that God's going to bring a lot of good out of all this. And I know it's terrible that people are suffering and dying and, and being hospitalized. Believe me, they're in my prayers. I pray for my family members. My goodness, I've got a son working in the emergency department at Stormont Vale Hospital. I've got my wife working as a nurse at the Cole Mary and Neal Veteran Affairs Medical Center in Topeka. Got another daughter working at Providence Living Center. She's on the front lines of nursing. And then I've got a couple other sons who are in school where they're right now having to be pretty much isolated at home for their learning. They're doing it online. But, you know, we're still out in the public. And I just pray that everybody is taking precautions. But, you know, the, 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 part here that I believe where God can actually do some things is the fact that I believe it's going to reinforce this idea that I've had for years. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but that's that everybody is a minister. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the clergy you know, or a bigger church. Maybe you've got a pastor of assimilation, a pastor of music, a family pastor, a youth pastor, a children's minister, a worship leader, the senior pastor, the associate pastor. You, know, you may have, some churches have dozen pastors or more, you know, and that's great. I mean, some big churches, they need these pastors because one pastor can only do so much. But even in our churches, which aren't big, the opportunity is that we need more pastors, more ministers. And now it's obvious that I think some of the folks are realizing we've got to pick up the slack here because now it's our turn to start reaching out to people, maybe in ways we've never done before. And that's what I'm thinking, friends, is maybe the silver lining here is that we are seeing how God can really use each of us in the lives of other people, not even by getting out of our chair for that matter. It's about getting in touch with people, calling them, letting them know we care about them, praying with them on the phone, and then practically asking them, is there something I can do to help you? Or can I help line up assistance for you? Maybe you can't help people yourself. Maybe you're at a point where you just can't get out and go get a bunch of groceries for somebody else and bring it to them. Maybe you need groceries yourself, but you can still pray for people. And then, again, let other people know what you need. And maybe there's a way we can do what we do as far as the church, which is we help other people. We help our members, especially the folks that come and are part of our church family. And I love to see the church as a family. When I look out at the congregations at Oakland United Methodist Church and Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church, I see families. And actually, I kind of see them as one big family, just in different locations. 
I love some of the bigger churches. They have what they call campuses. They have this campus for their big church of 2,000 people or so. And then they have another church with 500 people, maybe another satellite church over here with another 500 or 200. And they've got all these little churches and they do video sermons. And, and that's fine. I, I I think at some point a church has to say, hey, now, you know what, we've, we've grown big enough. Now we're going to split up and we're going to, we're going to now birth this new church. So that makes him the mother church, so to speak, you know? So anyhow, kind of got off topic there a little bit, but, but, but the point is, look, we're all ministers. I was at a church just a couple of days ago and I was leaving the parking lot and they had a sign and it said, now you're entering the mission field as you're getting ready to go out of the parking lot into the streets of Topeka. Well, I say amen to that. The mission field is all around us. The neighborhood in Oakland, huge mission field. The neighborhood in North Topeka, another huge mission field. And I really believe God has great things in store for both of these congregations. We just have to kind of pull together in a new way. And I believe that through all of this, that we are going through right now, that we're going to learn how to now pull together. We're going to learn how we can exercise our spiritual gifts, particularly those of compassion and caring, hospitality in the sense of maybe not bringing them into our house, but making people feel welcome just by visiting with them and letting them know that we care about them. You know, I think hospitality takes a lot of different forms. And we can open up ourselves to people and show them hospitality in that regard. So anyway... Remember now, you're a minister. We, we were talking, uh, I think the last time I got together, or one of the last times I had been up at my course of study up in Kansas City, and it was said there that I believe it was Karl Barth, the theologian, and maybe even Martin Luther, who said, everyone's a theologian. And I said, so congratulations. Now, everybody here is the theologian, which means you're a student of God's word. And, you know, we should all be a student of God's word and one that takes it seriously and really applies it to our lives. So I just say that today to encourage you that you're a minister. Don't feel like it has to be somebody else. Don't feel like you're sitting in the grandstand watching out there as somebody else is performing. No, you can be on the field playing as well. You can be on that court playing basketball. You don't have to stand on the sideline and just go, well, you know, this was... When I used to play basketball years ago, but you know now I'm a little old for that, so I'm just watching from the sideline. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if you could get out there and play basketball like you did when you were younger? You know, if you're a little bit older like me, hey, guess what? God's got space for you on the court and on the field. He wants us to get out of the bleachers and get busy doing what he wants us to do. Not that we're earning his favor. No, 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 that's got nothing to do with it. He's just got work for us to do. He's got things he wants us to do. And we should want to do it, and it's fun. I'll tell you, there is nothing more enjoyable than feeling like God used me today in a certain way. So just start out maybe by making a phone call to somebody you're thinking about. Send them a text message if that's on your agenda. And don't hesitate. Don't say, well, I'll do it later. And you know what? And it never, never, it later never happens most of the time. It, if you don't do it when you're thinking of it, it isn't going to happen. So just be spontaneous. And sometimes you're going to go, that person didn't really seem to welcome my call. Don't let that discourage you. Just keep going. Keep going. God will bless you. Well, once again, this is Reverend Phil Anderson, pastor of Oakland United Methodist Church in Kansas Avenue, United Methodist Church here in the capital city of Kansas, Topeka. And again, we welcome all members of the churches. If you're joining us, if you're a member of either of those two churches, if you're a visitor, my goodness, we, we want to give you a special welcome, just like we would if you came in and sat down in the back row of our service on Sunday. We'd say, don't leave until we can meet you. I used to say, don't meet, and don't leave till we can shake your hand. Well, we can't shake your hand now, but we can at least welcome you and greet you in the Lord and say, thank you for joining us, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your religious background or your location or your race or your gender or any other thing that people use these days to categorize each other. You know what? We don't put people in a box. We welcome all people. We love all people. We let God do all the work that needs to be done in somebody's life. We just want to let you know we're glad that you are with us. So with that, let us go ahead and have a word of prayer as we get our devotional off the ground here this day. Gracious God, we thank you again for the word that you give us that is so powerful. Lord, we Think about this time now that we are in Holy Week, Lord, as we continue the walk to the cross, the journey to the cross. We're following in the footsteps of Jesus here. And Lord, this is a sobering time of the year because now we are getting to the crunch time. We're getting to that time where Jesus Christ is going to be handed over to the authorities and he's going to be soon put to death on the cross. And Lord, it's because of what we did 
that Jesus Christ went to the cross. We can blame other people for it, but Lord, it's ultimately because of what I did. It was my sins that put Jesus on that cross. But you know what? It was the love of Jesus that kept him on that cross. And Jesus loves us so much. Help us, Lord, to remember the great, great love that you have for us as we continue this time of going through the road to Calvary with Jesus. And now, Lord, we ask your special blessing upon each one listening to this today. If there's any people listening who have spiritual needs, Lord, mental needs, physical needs, Lord, I pray that you would address those and bless them with those needs. Meet them where they're at, Lord. And Father, help them to reach out to help for others to help them. If they need help, Lord, help them to know that they can call and Others will be glad to help them right now, especially as we're in this time where I really feel like you've softened a lot of hearts, Lord, and you're making it much more um, of a thing where we like to help out, where we see the need to help out. Whereas in the past, we've sort of isolated ourselves. Well, Lord, now we're more together because of this. And uh, Lord, I just pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Well, you know, as we were praying just now, I had a thought. I want to share this with you. And we may have to bring this up again because it just came to me. There was a term that has come out through all of this coronavirus. And it's called social distance. Social distance. Distance. We know what that means. We're supposed to stay at least six feet apart from people. If we're cold, if we've got a cold, if we've got symptoms, if we're running a temperature, if we're coughing, if we're sneezing, if we're really fatigued, probably best off not being around anybody, even family members for that matter. Probably find a place in your house and just sort of hunker down up there. Maybe if we have a radio or a computer or something, you can kind of pass the time. Good book will help. But we hear this term, social distance. And Tony Evans, the great pastor from Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, was on television last Sunday morning. I just happened to catch him. He's on about 6.30 on Sunday morning. And as I listened to him, he said, you know what? It's not about social distancing. We don't want to be apart socially. We want to be apart physically. And I thought, well, you know what, man? He had it on the head. Somebody coined this term social distancing and it just caught on like wildfire. But I think the more accurate term is physical distancing, right? We stand in line at the store and you'll see if you do go to the store, which I've been to a few, I try not to go out very often, but when I go, sometimes there'll even be signs now, please maintain social distancing six feet apart. And you'll go in before you even get in, there are signs, please adhere to our social distancing guidelines six feet apart if you're standing in line and I was walking through Sam's Club just today and looked over there at the, I guess, so, uh, the, the, the customer service area. And sure enough, people were about six feet apart. You know, just imagine a few weeks ago, you could have been so close, you could have smelled the person's bad breath behind you, you know. And now uh, we're so far apart, you can't really do that, which I guess is maybe a good thing. I don't know. But here's the thought I wanted to share with you. Through all of this coronavirus and COVID-19, something interesting has transpired. And that is, I believe, many of us have become less socially isolated than it ever, than we ever have been for many, many, maybe years. Because I think we see the need to reach out and stay in touch. We can't just assume that people are going to show up at church on Sunday and we'll see them then. Because guess what? Sometimes people don't come to church on Sunday. And then we don't reach them. So they've, they've gone now maybe two weeks between any contact because they missed that first week. So then they, were, they didn't get any contact the week before they missed. And then they're not getting any contact until they come back. Let's just say you miss one week in church. You've missed two weeks of someone greeting you and asking how you're doing from the church family. And I believe now what's happening is that we are more attuned to reaching out to each other and to being more connected, even though it's been difficult. And this may go on for a while. Like I was saying yesterday, we don't know how long this is going to last. It could be several weeks, could be several months, could be a year. Who knows? 
But God is in control, and we can rest in that. We can take great comfort in knowing that Jesus Christ is with us. And again, fill your minds with positive things. Fill your minds with the Scripture. Fill your minds with the Word of God. There are so many devotionals. I mentioned those last week, but I'll just tell you again, they're out there. And if, if you need more help on that, just let me know and I'll give you a bunch of them. I read maybe nine a day when I am able. I don't do it every day. Some days I read just a few, but the last few days I've been intentionally reading devotionals. And I'll tell you what, what a blessing. I'm reading these devotionals, friends, and I'm getting these insights from God just from reading what somebody else is saying and how they're relating their faith to what's going on now with the coronavirus or it's just a devotional that may have been written months ago that just sort of fit in for today but regardless the word of god you know we know will not come back empty it says in isaiah we know that when god's word goes forth it's going to come back and it's going to produce fruit in our lives so most important thing i believe right now is to stay connected to the word of god we said this even before we really started our Lenten journey back in February. I remember one of the things that we mentioned in the sermon was this is a time where we can quiet ourselves and give God about 30 minutes a day. This was before the coronavirus, by the way. And we can just listen to the voice of God speaking to us, comforting us, or just allowing God to be with us and to just know he's there if we just turn everything off turn off the tv turn off the radio turn off the computer turn off the phone you know and just listen to him and then the other thing i would add to that now knowing now what i didn't know then is limit yourself on how much of the news that you're trying to consume each day it would be almost like going to an all-you-could-eat buffet for like five meals a day if you're sitting here just inundating yourself with this we know it's there we know there are certain things we have to take precautions for stay stay apprised of it stay up to date and then let it go and just trust god i believe that's really the thing we can do and practice those guidelines that we're being told to practice so that's just my encouragement today and again i think that though we talk about social distancing I believe this has actually helped to bring us more socially together and more spiritually connected because we're now reaching out to people that maybe in a way we've never done before. Amen. So let's continue this into the future, regardless of where we would see this coronavirus epidemic come to an end. And God willing, it will have an end point before long. And remember to pray for those afflicted by it. Pray for those who have suffered with it and who are in the hospital now, who are dealing with the sickness in their homes, perhaps, and those who have died. Pray for them and their families. Just pray constantly that God is going to intervene in the situation. And then leave the results to God and move on with your life and look ahead with confidence and assurance that God has this under control. Amen. Well, we kind of started off here with that, and uh, I hope that was okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm conversing with you on these devotionals like I would if I was sitting down with you at the house. Only difference is I'm not, letting, I'm not getting to hear from you, and I would normally love to have a little give and take. Maybe there's a way to do that online eventually. I know there's a few things. I think one of them is called Zoom, and we just kind of need to figure out how we get that off the ground. And it may be that we do that after easter it probably won't be before easter but we may be able to do some of that real soon as well so stay tuned it's all a work in progress amen and we just trust god that he's going to lead us exactly where he wants us to go okay well now let's go ahead and read our final part of the 27th chapter of matthew that we've started on the last couple of days here in passion week uh, as we prepare for monday thursday or some call it Holy Thursday, tomorrow. So we read again in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We'll read Psalm 27, beginning here with verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, 
the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone who they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. And they put a reed on his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put a, the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself! If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah at once. One of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. 
The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he had been raised from the dead. And the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, We have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. And that, dear friends, is our reading of the scripture today. Well, we have the account of the crucifixion here in the Gospel of Matthew. Of course, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels because there's a lot of similarities to them. The Gospel of John's a little different, and each of them has things a little bit uniquely presented. But it's hard to read that part that we just got done reading without thinking of the concept here of Jesus Christ as God, fully man, fully God. And the way that he was rejected by people, how he was mistreated. When I read the part about them taunting Jesus and putting the crown of thorns on him and beating him and ridiculing him. And Jesus took all that. He could have retorted and responded and snarled back at them, but he took that beating and that suffering just for us. And it was all part of the purpose of why he came. Jesus had that divine mission all ready prepared. And as we know, he fulfilled a lot of prophecies as the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world when he went to the cross and was sacrificed for our sins. Certainly we know there's a lot of prophecy that's related to this in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, which was written some 700 years before the birth of Christ. I'd just like to read a little bit from Isaiah 53 as we wrap up our devotional today. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. 
He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Well, prophecy from 700 years before Jesus pretty much gives us the picture of what transpired that day when Jesus Christ was led up to the cross and where he was put to death for our sins. This is the whole reason for Lent, I think, is to bring us back into a sharp focus of what Jesus Christ did for each one of us and how he went willingly and he didn't oppose people. He didn't say anything that would defend himself for his own integrity regarding how unfair all of this was and how they'd made a mistake. No, Jesus knew that this was his divine appointment. So today, friends, we can only say thank you to Jesus for doing what he did for us. We give him all the praise and glory for being such a loving God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us enough that he died on the cross for our sins. Well, this will conclude our Lenten devotional now for Wednesday, April the 8th. Be with us tomorrow as we go through our Monday, Thursday devotional. We ask God would bless you as we continue to have these times together online. Remember, invite your friends and other church members to tune in again to kaumc.church. Now let's conclude this devotional with a prayer. Our loving God, we can't thank you enough for what you've done for us, where you came to earth so that we could have this relationship with you the way you created life to be. Lord, you've restored us to the original way that life was supposed to be. Even though there's sin all around us, that's a broken world in which we live. There's problems everywhere we look. And yet, Lord, you have brought us back into this wonderful relationship with you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God on the cross of Calvary, who took all of our sins upon himself and exchanged that for his righteousness for ourselves. So, Lord, when you see us, you're just seeing the holy, pure, perfect people that you created and that you intended us to be. Lord, we admit our sins. We admit our our failures. We admit the times we've come up short. And Lord, we ask you would remove those sins from our hearts and our lives right now. We ask you to forgive us and restore us into that relationship with you, Lord, through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we thank you for being with us today. This is Reverend Phil Anderson, Oakland United Methodist Church in Kansas Avenue, United Methodist Church here in Topeka. Do join us again on Thursday, April the 9th, as we have a special devotional for Monday, Thursday, or Holy Thursday. And we will read several more scriptures on that day to get us prepared for the conclusion of Holy Week and a celebration of Easter on Sunday. Now may God richly bless you. It is our prayer. Have a great day.